They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. You had a — you have a case which — they're dying to get this thing started. The judge cannot go faster. He wants to get it started so badly. Welcome back to America Decides. That was former President Trump this afternoon reacting to news that the hush money payment trial in New York will begin officially on April 15th. For more on this, let's bring in Notre Dame law professor Derek Muller. And Major Garrett, of course, is here with us again. Uh, Derek, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, you know, Trump earlier today said that this is all political, uh, that it is unfair, in his words, to have a trial in the middle of an election. So I'm curious kind of how you would assemble an impartial jury for the trial of a former president. Of course, we've never been here before. No, we haven't. Um, we've never had a former president indicted like this. Uh, then he's running for re-election, so that complicates things. He's been running for re-election for well over a year. It's a very public case, so voters and potential jurors know what is potentially in the air, what's in the water. And we're trying to find out uh, when we voir dire the jurors, prospective jurors, are they going to be impartial? Are they going to be as fair as possible? And are they going to be able to hear this evidence with an open mind and before they convict somebody? It's going to be a, a very challenging affair from the very beginning of trying to navigate this trial. Professor, it was said when the Manhattan District Attorney was contemplating these charges that if he brought these felonies, it would be kind of a leap or a stretching of understood law in terms of misdemeanor and felonies. Is that true based on what you've reviewed of this trial as it moves closer to actual courtroom procedures? Yeah, one of the things you mentioned in the earlier segment was how Trump keeps losing a lot of cases in court. And it's interesting to watch this one because I think there are going to be some challenges for the prosecutors here. I mean, a lot of these business falsification and documents cases, usually they bring an additional charge beyond just the falsification, like larceny, something like that. We don't have that here. We just have the business falsification. And they can't just say that he falsified business records. It had to be falsification with an additional crime underlying it, such as a violation of federal election law, which is a little strange because this is a New York state proceeding referring to federal election law. It's actually deeply unclear whether hush payments are a violation of federal election law. Um, John Edwards, former North Carolina senator who ran for president, um, also was accused in federal court years ago of paying hush payments to a mistress, um, those cases were thrown out. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a question about whether or not this will proceed. So lots of complicated questions for, for the prosecutors, but then a lot of things that, that Trump and his team are going to have to defend in these novel charges. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about that lack of a legal um, roadmap, if you will, because we've not been here before. Um, how do you assemble witnesses for this kind of thing? What would that look like? Yeah, so here we're going to be trying to trace out from Michael Cohen or his associates about the money that was being gathered and the use for it. I think everyone agrees that this was hush money, right? This was used to silence the uh, former porn pornographic actress who maybe Trump had an affair with and has denied. But we have the money just knowing that those things swirling around could have damaged the campaign. So we're going to be trying to find people who had heard of this affair, people who were aware of the money that was going through. But, but again, we're dealing a lot of records, a lot of documents, a lot of sort of forensic accounting experts, if you will, to talk about these things. And then it's going to be this question about getting into Trump's state of mind. Did he know he was trying to cover something up? He was trying to conceal it. There was this legal question there. It's always the problem in these prosecutions is to get into uh, the defendant's state of mind. And so we'll see what the prosecutor uh, has to show next month. Professor, for those who watch today's proceedings on the reduction of the bond that the former president has to put up in order to pursue his appeal of the civil fraud case, the separate case, not the one dealing with Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, they will ask themselves, did Trump win something today or was it sort of uh, a temporary victory? How would you assess that? It's only a victory, but I would qualify it as you did as a temporary victory. Uh, it's pretty rare for a bond like this to get reduced on appeal. The point is, once you've lost uh, a case at the trial court level before you can appeal, we want to make sure that you have the money in place and you're not just postponing everything. We want to be able to wrap this up if the appeal doesn't have any merit. But this is a huge, huge award at $454 million. Very rarely do we see awards reduced. 
But in cases, you know, I think of one from the 80s involving some oil companies in the billions of dollars, those are the kinds of things that get reduced. So the reduction to 175 million, right, that's not that's not uh, Trump change, right? That, that's a significant sum that Trump's team is still going to have to come up with. Um, so a temporary victory that he doesn't have to be on the hook for the full 454 million today, um, but something short-lived as that appeal is going to press forward and probably press forward fairly quickly. And is there any chance that that could be further reduced? It is. So one of the things in appeal, right, is to figure out whether or not that size of the award was justified by the evidence. And so one of the things that Trump's campaign is going to be arguing at first is that he wasn't liable. But second, that even if he is liable, that he didn't inflate the value of his assets to such a significant degree that this amount of money is what he should be on the hook for. So he will be pressing both whether he's liable and the amount of liability on appeal. So again, it's a good sign that the New York Court of Appeals here is allowing that to be reduced right now. Um, I wouldn't read it too much into it to say that they're going to reduce it in the future, just that as a temporary matter, given the size of the award, they're going to reduce it only to let him appeal so they can hear the case. All right, Professor Derek Muller, thank you for explaining this in terms we can all understand a lot to unwind with all of these different cases. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much for having me.